It is, okay. Wonderful, so welcome everyone to this side event um, to the Financing for Development Forum on measuring illicit financial flows. Uh, my name is Boyan. and I'm a statistician with UNCTAD Statistics, and I have been working together with my colleagues, um, Amandina, Nu, and everybody else for, from uh, which you will meet today uh, from other agencies as well on illicit financial flows. So before we kick start on with today's uh, event, maybe just a few um, words around the organizational or logistical aspects. First of all, this recording uh, this meeting is being recorded, so I hope everyone is, is okay with this. Um, second, uh, we kindly ask all participants to mute themselves um, unless they are speaking. Uh, if you do want to, uh, to, to, to raise a point or a question, please first raise your hand. Otherwise, also feel free to use the chat. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat as much as possible. Um, we have a rather full agenda today, so I kindly invite all the speakers to observe the time limits we have agreed on um, beforehand. And on the contact side, so we will talk about illicit financial flows today. Of course, we have questions, so what are illicit financial flows? And moreover, how do we measure them? And of course, in the end, how do we use the results of the measurement for policy formulation. So on this note, um, and without much further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker for a, for a brief introduction. Uh, this is my colleague, Anu Peltola. She's an acting director of UNCTAD Statistics. Um, Anu, the floor is yours for a few uh, brief introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Boyan. Thank you very much, colleagues, for joining today. We are living very challenging times. We, we are seeing compounding crisis with climate change, environmental degradation, the pandemic, increasing inequalities and debt distress. And at the same time, large amounts of illicit financial flows slip through the cracks of the official economy. Illicit financial flows drain resources that will be painfully needed to fulfill human rights and pursue sustainable development and to build resilience to face crises of the future. But what can we do? This is a really tricky area. How much do we know about illicit finance? Countries did commit to the SDG target 16.4, which aims to significantly reduce illicit financial flows and arms arms flows, strengthen the recovery and return of stolen assets and combat all forms of organized crime by 2030. But has there been any progress globally in addressing illicit financial flows? This is a true challenge. It has taken a lot of time even to agree on a global definition of the scope of illicit financial flows for the 2030 agenda. But this agreement has been achieved now as the UN Statistical Commission um, by all member states and international organizations in March 2022 adopted the conceptual framework for the measurement of illicit financial flows, which was developed by UNCTAD together with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. As we are the global custodian agencies of the SDG indicator 1641, and this work was carried out in consultation with a global task force on measuring illicit financial flows. Illicit financial flows are not only difficult to define, but also challenging to measure, as they are deliberately hidden and take many forms. Sorry, we're trying to find out where the music comes from. <laughs> Thanks for the music. <laughs> I think we needed that. Yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. So yes, um, illicit financial flows are really tricky um, to measure, to curb. Um, this has been challenging work. In the beginning, we thought, what can we possibly do? But um, we have managed to work together with, with partners globally to advance this agenda step by step. 
the co-custodian agencies have drawn on countries and international efforts to estimate illicit financial flows. We've developed methodological guidance to measure tax and commercial IFFs and also to measure the crime side of illicit finance. In total, 22 pilots have been carried out globally across three continents now, earlier in Latin America and lately in Asia and Africa, where we've been working closely with the countries and the regional commissions, ESCAP and ECA. You will hear more from them today. We'll focus on the tax and commercial side of IFFs and we'll share with you the latest results of this work. We have learned that while it's challenging, illicit financial flows can be measured. Huge global capacity development effort will be needed going forward to make this a reality and empower all governments to be able to develop their own estimates of illicit financial flows and to inform their national policy priorities in this regard. To this end, UNCTAD and UNODC are working in global collaboration with all UN regional commissions to support member states. Today, we are joined here by ECA and ESCAP to showcase early results and to share the message that we can do something. We have the concepts, we have the methods, now also the first estimates to understand illicit financial flows so that we would be able to address them and be better equipped and more effective in our, our work to curb IFFs. Thank you so much for joining us today. I look forward to the discussions. Thank you, Anu. Thank you for your time out of your busy schedule. And uh, you have mentioned it. So we are joined today with ECA, so Economic Commission for Africa, and ESCAP, Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Um, and on that note, I would like to invite uh, our dear colleague Douglas, pardon, Douglas from ECA uh, for a few introductory remarks. Douglas, over to you. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you very much to participants. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be speaking on behalf of my chief who cannot make it today. And I must also recognize the presence of my director, Adam, who is attending from New York. Um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's really very much a, a great pleasure to share our experience in statistical evaluation of IFF in Africa, the progress we've made so far and the plan we have to, to sustain the progress, of course, in partnership with um, our key partners. For us at the ECA, the journey started actually in 2011 when we were mandated by the AU ECA Ministers of Finance in 2010 to act as the Secretariat of the HLP of IFF from Africa. The focus of the panel, led by the former president of South Africa, um, Tabumbeki, was on assessing the magnitude and development impact of illicit financial flows. In doing so, the panel made some con conscious decisions, including first, the definition of IFFs, which con contrasted with the existing terminology of capital flight which blames developing countries for driving legal capital away. In its conceptual approach, the panel highlighted that tackling IFFs in Africa was a problem that required a global solution, not only action by countries themselves. Second, the focus of the conceptual framework, it was focused on development impact rather than mere illegality. Therefore, IFFs include illegal activities plus aggressive tax avoidance, which is legal but harmful to development. Third, the reason for focusing on trade misvoicing model. The decision was taken mainly based on several factors, including disproportionate development impact of IFF commercial activities, difficulties in measuring corruption, owing to its perception-based um, measures, farm level data requirements of transfer pricing method, and in-depth examination of individual multinational companies' behavior, which was costly and often impossible to access. And finally, wide coverage of trade statistics under com trade for countries over time. Dear colleagues, dear participants, in early 2015, 
the AU heads of state and government adopted the panel recommendations and the common African position on the sustainable development goals included the goal of curtailing IFFs. African negotiators' excellent work ensured that these African positions were carried forward into global declarations. Eventually, curtailing IFFs was included as one of the, targeters, the targets of Goal 16 of the Sustainable Goal Development. Dear colleague, the HLP strongly highlighted the urgent need for solid evidence on the volume, channels, and development impact of IFFs to help member states design more effective policies to address these flows. Out of the 21 recommendations of the Mbeki panel report, two relevant, more specific recommendations were First of all, study potential methodologies for addressing IFFs. Second, ECA to provide operational measures against IFFs. In line with this recommendation and to support Agenda 2030 attainment, ECA has since been supporting African countries in addressing IFF in various capacities, including this DA11 project in collaboration with UNCTAD to statistically estimate IFF through an agreed upon methodology that produces robust, consistent, and where possible compar comparable estimates. Following the publication of the conceptual framework for the statistical measurement of IFFs and subsequent methodological guide guidelines produced by UNCTAD and UNDC, the two custodians of the SD indicator 16.4.1, a pilot project called IFF uh, DA11 on statistical measurement of IFF was implemented in partnership with UNCTAD in, tw in 12 pilot country, African pilot countries, namely Angola, Benin, Burkina Faso, Egypt, Gabon, Ghana, Mozambique, Namibia, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Zambia. Distinguished participants, allow me to share some, some of the key takeaway from this journey we've undertaken together with UNCTAD in these 12 African pilot countries. In the first phase of the project, key stakeholders were mapped. Countries data availability and statistical capacity were assessed to select the appropriate methodology for IFFs. Countries through their technical working groups selected the relevant type of IFF and appropriate methodology. Therefore, this process was fully country driven. Technical assistance to pilot country were provided through training and methodology text testing between October to May 21-22. As a result, most of pilot country came up with statistical estimates of IFFs using at least one methodology. Some of the key lessons learned from the exercise we've undertaken together with UNCTAD in this pilot country include the following. First, on technical side, there, there are a number of challenges that need to be recognized, including data quality, data quality reporting and tight schedules coupled with competing demands that impacted the production, approval, validation, and publication of results. Douglas, I'm sorry to jump in on this. Um, I trust we will have a bit more time in the session to, to, to share those experience. Uh, in the interest of time, I would kind of like to ask you to maybe just wrap up in another half a minute or so, so we can move ahead. Apologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boyan. Um, I, I, would I would just try to wrap up. Um, one thing important I wanted to highlight it as um, a potential or very a recognized impact of the work we've undertaken is that ECA with UNCTAD was recommended in our in in the last um, 45 session of the Conference of African Ministers of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, and providing recommendation that um, ECA continue to support um, the capacity training on tax-related matters, as well as to build the capacity of African countries 
to tackle gaps in institutional arrangement um, with a view to developing ability to track, measure, and report on the evolution of IFF. It is critical to advance the pilot testing to leverage ongoing efforts and peer learning opportunity. We have the action plan developed in different countries to ensure the sustainability of production of IFF in the pilot country. Let me take this opportunity to thank all the pilot countries for their commitment, hard work, and continued efforts in the statistical measurement. We would also sincerely thank the resident coordinators office and regional partners for the unwavering support provided through the time. Last but not least, I, rec I recognize our strong partnership and teamwork with UNCTAD, UNODC, and ECA to make this work a success. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Douglas. And I thank um, many of the case studies and examples we will have in the countries in the following session will confirm or let's say address the points that you mentioned on the terms of the challenges and the successes of the common work. Regardless of that, and last but definitely not least, we have another regional commission that has been very actively engaged in addressing the illicit financial flows together with UNODC and UNCTAD, namely ESCAP. Alik, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Boyan, um, and uh, the dear colleagues, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Uh, my name is Alik from the Economic uh, Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific here in Bangkok. Um, I'm a statistician in the SCAP Statistics Division, and um, um, speaking on behalf of my section chief, Ms. Ricky Hansen, who is tied up in another meeting, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I've been leading uh, this work in SCAP at a technical level. So thank you for joining us uh, this uh, morning or afternoon. Uh, regarding the work on illicit uh, financial flows, as a commission, we've been very actively involved, um, emanating from um, the, the DA12 project or the development account project for those that are not familiar with the UN terms from last year and uh, thanks to the work uh, that were championed by UNODC and UNCTAD uh, to um, produce uh, the conceptual framework which really gave us the groundwork to really make an attempt uh, to make uh, estimates by working with uh, pilot countries uh, in some parts of uh, this region. Um, as ESCAP, um, one of our flagship publications is an SDG progress report where every year we publish a report using various um, information from the SDG database to see our, the position of Asia Pacific in terms of um, which goal or which target is likely to be made or which is actually regressive or where data is actually missing. And the goal 16, um, that's where we've had serious problems in terms of data availability. And I think issues of illicit financial flows, as uh, my two colleagues have highlighted, um, the things that are illegal or sometimes legit, but done undercover, and makes it very difficult to, um, uh, to collect information and they play around different stakeholders in the countries depending on different uh, interests. However, I think one critical aspect is that um, illicit financial flows do affect the national resource envelopes that are actually very critical to attain all of the targets because you require financing to achieve uh, those specific targets. So from the DA12 project, we took interest and have worked with uh, three countries. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean <laughs> two countries that are in Uzbekistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan on tax and commercial related work. And uh, my colleagues will give more detail on the progress of that work. Um, however, let me also emphasize that as ESCAP, we took extra efforts to source financing to continue this work and consolidate on the progress we've made using other internal resources uh, because we find this very interesting. So 
And I think what we've also observed is that mismatch between measurement and the policy. And I think the first phase of our work has focused on measurement, but going forward, I think we are finding that the policy is becoming more imperative, uh, getting the users and the producers together. I think this is the path we'll be walking through and we'll, have, we'll be having discussions throughout uh, uh, for this uh, webinar. So I would like to thank you all and I look forward to your participative engagement. Do raise questions and share your own experiences on uh, how best we can really address the measurement issues and uh, get that connection with policy um, very right and correct for uh, sustainable development. So Boyan, thank you so much for according me uh, this uh, time. Over to you. Thank you, Alec. Um, and very well said. Yes, true. Today we will look at first the measurement, but then focus on the policy side and see how to build uh, bridges uh, between those two spheres to essentially address illicit financial flows comprehensively. On this note, I would like to end on this introductory part and uh, hand over to my colleague Amandine, please. Thank you, Boyan. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone as we are spread um, on the planet. Um, so we will now have three presentations and a discussion on the statistical measurement of tax and commercial IFF with countries' experience and results from two previous projects held in Africa and in Asia. Um, so as my colleague was saying, this session uh, precedes the second one on how to connect the measurement of IFF and policy actions. As we all know, data are key to inform policy, right? Um, so without any delay, I will first give the floor to my colleague Boyan, um, who will give a brief introduction on UNCTAD statistics work on the statistical measurement of IFF. Um, then our colleagues from ESCAP will introduce their presenter from Kyrgyzstan. And um, lastly, we'll have our colleagues from ECA who will introduce their presenters from Namibia and from Zambia. And we will finish with a session with an open Q&A. Um, so just as a reminder, don't hesitate to write your questions in the chat or raise your hand uh, at the end of the session when we will be opening for question and answer. Um, so Boyan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amandine. Uh, a lot has been actually said in, in, in the introductory speeches, uh, so I'm going to just make a few major points, which I think would be uh, an important introductory to, to the measurement side. So the first of all, before we start measuring, we need to know what we are talking about. So the conceptual framework that was uh, devised by UNCTAD and UNODC and supported by the task force on the measurement of illicit financial flows provides these agreed concepts and definitions on illicit financial flows. There is a internationally agreed definition for the measurement, statistical measurement of IFFs for the SDG indicator 16.4.1. Next, of course, once we know what we are talking about, we need to see how to, to address it in the measurement phase. So the measurement, let's say, front was twofolded. On one side, UNCTAD led the work on the tax and commercial illicit financial flows to address the questions of trade misinvoicing, of aggressive tax avoidance, which are important, as Douglas has mentioned, from the development perspective, and tax evasion by individuals. In parallel, on the crime side, UNODC has developed and still continues to develop um, methods to address IFFs from um, criminal activities such as drug trafficking, smuggling of migrants, trafficking in persons, and so on. Since 2018, up to the end of last year, 22 pilots, so 22 countries have pilot tested the methods, and those country pilots have shown that illicit financial flows can be estimated. So this, we believe, is a very crucial element to show that our work together with regional commissions and the work together with national authorities should continue. And what is even more exciting is that now for the first time we have official, even though preliminary, estimates on SDG indicator 16.4.1 available in the global SDG database. 
These refer to the crime side IFFs at this stage. However, we are here today to discuss the tax and commercial IFFs. In the work with 14 countries, 12 in Africa and two in Asia, we have together with the regional commissions and national authorities um, found out that essentially many methodologies that have been presented can be applied. However, there is significant, um, let's say, challenges still laying ahead of us. So to address it from the methodological perspective, but also from purely organizational. So how to organize the work in a country, within the national technical uh, working groups, if you call it that way, how to organize training, how to provide um, access to the data in turn to produce robust evidence base for uh, formulating policies to curb illicit financial flows. So we will see some of those cases today. Um, and on that end, um, Amadine, I would like to stop uh, to give sufficient time to the, to the regional commissions and the countries to present their work. So over to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Boyan. Um, so I will now give the floor to Anastasia uh, from ESCAP. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Uh, Alik already mentioned uh, in ASCAP, we um, uh, pilot tested the methods that were suggested to us by Tad. And in the, uh, by the link in the chat, you can see this uh, guidelines to the methodology of measuring illicit financial flows. So we have been pilot testing the suggested methods in two countries of Central Asia. And the two countries were Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, we selected these countries because they have very high risks, as they themselves estimated from different non-crime activities uh, to IFF. So, uh, and uh, we have been testing the methods during 2020 and 2021. In the end of 2022, uh, some results were already presented. So today uh, we are going to Today uh, we are going to present some of those results and concerns and challenges and implications that IFF measurement has on to finance and for development. Our presenter today is uh, Mr. Chingiz Bekan of our national consultant in Kyrgyzstan and uh, a specialist on IFF. Chingiz, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Anastasia, Anastasia, for giving me the floor. And um, as Anastasia uh, has already mentioned, I am a national consultant on IFFs here in Kyrgyzstan. And I was engaged in mm -hmm. measuring illicit financial flows uh, in the Kyrgyz Republic. And, uh, I would like to make uh, a small report on what happened here in Kyrgyzstan while measuring IFFs. Uh, so, before uh, discussing the process of measuring illicit financial flows in the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, it is important to address two key issues that underscore the need to measure tax and commercial IFFs in the country. This issue arises from international trade and involves the smuggling of goods and uh, so-called grey export of goods. And these activities existed in Kyrgyzstan for over two decades and it is facilitated mainly due to the country's location on the route of goods uh, going from east to west and vice versa, uh, as well as its participation in economic customs unions and uh, dishonest, uh, dishonest foreign trade participants and even uh, criminals use these advantages of Kyrgyzstan for duty-free trade with partner countries by manipulating of customs rules, uh, by falsificating of customs documents, uh, uh, by uh, underestimating of volume and prices of goods, uh, also changing the country of origin of goods to appear as local production. Uh, there are also various risks and threats that come with smuggling, such as a decrease in revenues of the country's budget uh, due to the shortfall in customs payments, uh, taxes and fees. Uh, smuggling also increases the size of the shadow economy, corruption in the state agencies, uh, the socio-economic vulnerability, 
uh, the, the formation and development of organized criminal groups, including translation, transnational ones, uh, and also poses a threat to the economic security of the country and the region as a whole. <coughs> uh, the primary problem uh, in measuring and assessing the level and volume uh, and uh, the, the level and volume of uh, good smuggling in Kyrgyzstan is the lack of certain tools and methods uh, to obtain estimated data on the volume of smuggling and its illegal financial flows. There is also a challenge uh, in estimating the lack of income for the state budget uh, due to smuggling. And the only possible uh, tool to measure the volume of smuggling and budget shortfalls is based on detected cases uh, of good smuggling, uh, which does not reflect the real picture, given the only a small part of the smuggling is detected and stopped. Uh, so the SCAP assisted IFF's measurement uh, project in Kyrgyzstan was launched in the second half 2021. And uh, during the first stage of the project, uh, we determined main directions, tools, participants, and uh, methods of measurement, uh, as well as we uh, made preliminary analysis of the availability of data. And during the second stage of the project, we made a preliminary measurement uh, of the illicit financial flows here in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, the first results uh, of uh, which were presented first in October 2022 and then in early December 2022. Uh, during the measurement, we uh, were proposed and chosen uh, for the following uh, measurement, such as partner country method, uh, price filter method, and flows of, of offshore financial wealth. Also, we ch choose alternative methods uh, such as grey re-export and uh, illicit financial flows from remittances of labour migrants. Uh, these uh, two methods uh, are specifically to uh, uh, the situation in the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, so these uh, methods, above mentioned methods, were used to determine uh, approximate volume of IFFs in Kyrgyzstan from contraband, grey export of goods uh, and uh, remittances. Uh, we determined certain risks and sources that generated IFFs uh, and in additionally, while measuring IFFs from uh, trade in Kyrgyzstan, uh, we, uh, there was uh, an evidence of a connection IFFs from trade with uh, some criminal proceeds, uh, possibly related to the money laundering of criminal proceeds through foreign uh, trade operations. But this case uh, needs to be further studied and uh, uh, investigated. While measuring, we faced some challenges uh, such as data availability, uh, data sharing, uh, weak interagency cooperation, as well as uh, low level of awareness uh, regarding IFF's uh, measuring methods among uh, state agencies involved. But still, we reached uh, some results. Uh, for example, estimation showed uh, that uh, the largest source of IFFs uh, for Kyrgyzstan is trade, uh, ranging between 7.7 .7 and $11.3 billion annually between uh, 2017 and 2020. Uh, inward flows dominate uh, IFFs in Kyrgyzstan, and the primary source is final consumer's goods. Uh, moreover, Kyrgyzstan is also subject to invert IFS from illicit uh, remittances, uh, which is estimated to range between uh, 0 0.3 and $1.6 billion annually in 2017 and 2020. Uh, so there is, uh, there are still some steps uh, uh, to do. Uh, first, uh, we need to adapt IFS measurement methods to national characteristics and uh, conditions. Uh, there is a need to conduct uh, training events uh, for specialists from state bodies involved in the IFF's measurement. Uh, also, there is a need to develop national entitlement mechanisms and tools for the further implementation of proposed IFF's uh, measurement methods. And also, there is a need to measure not only trade and tax IFFs, but also IFFs from criminal activity, particularly from drug trafficking, human trafficking and uh, other forms. 
Uh, overall, the project brought uh, many benefits such as uh, enhancement of the level of uh, interagency cooperation and data sharing, acquisition of an IFF's measurement tool, uh, conducting industry risk assessment as well as uh, identifying and uh, analyzing risk, elimination of gaps in co-activities, elimination of shortcomings and reduction of IFFs in the uh, responsible directions. And, but more importantly, uh, the governmental level, the following out outcomes were achieved. Uh, uh, raised awareness of the volume of IFFs and their main uh, industries and sources. Identification uh, of the strong and weak sites of the policy carried out in, in the export and import flows of goods. And these outcomes will cause policy action that will eventually result in uh, improvement of tools and measures in the struggle against corruption, smuggling, tax evasion and other illicit uh, activities. Uh, reduction of the shadow economy, enhancement of the budget revenue, improvement of the socio-economic level and living standards of the population, ensuring economic security, increasing the level uh, of combating crime, uh, as well as improving the national uh, anti-money laundering system. And in conclusion, I would like to emphasize that uh, the measurement of illicit financial flows is the complex and challenging task uh, that requires the cooperation and commitment of multiple stakeholders, including government agencies, uh, the private sector, civil society, and international organizations as well. Uh, while there are risks and limitations associated with the proposed methods of, for measuring IFFs, the benefits and potential positive impacts on the economy and society are significant. Therefore, it is essential to continue working towards uh, developing and implementing effective measures uh, to combat illicit financial flows and ensure economic security and sustainability development. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chingis, for your presentation. Um, I will jump now to ECS. We don't have much time, but it was very interesting to hear you. And now uh, let's see how countries from the African region, uh, if they have experienced the same kind of uh, challenges or if they have the same type of IFF or what remains to be done. Um, so I will give the floor now to my colleague from ECA, Fazana, to, to take over for uh, Namibia and Zambia. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings, colleagues. Um, I am Farzana Sharmin. I work as Economic Affairs Officer in the Economic Governance and Public Finance Section of ECA. So um, as Boyan has mentioned, and as we learned from the opening speakers, um, in Africa, we had a total of 12 pilot countries who tested this methodology. And um, because of the country priorities and the nature of the economies, we usually found that tax and commercial related IFFs were the selected uh, uh, type of IFFs in Africa. Um, I just want to say that um, this selection was done by the country to our technical working group. Uh, they selected the type of IFFs, the sector that they want to cover. But without further ado, let us um, hear directly from um, our colleagues from Namibia and Zambia. We are very pleased today to be joined by them. Um, let me introduce Mr. Lamek Odadal, the national consultant who supported the IFF work in Namibia. Lamek, you may wave your hand. And Mr. Joseph Tembo, Assistant Director, Economic and Financial Statistics Division, Zambia Statistics Agency. I think I have seen Joseph, but um, you can open your camera if it is allowed um, uh, by the technology. So um, both of our colleagues will be sharing their experience in terms of measuring issues challenges that they might have faced, um, preliminary estimates and the policy implications. So over to you, Lamek, for sharing uh, Namibia experience. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all participants. And once again, thank you for inviting me. As I've been introduced, my name is Lamek Odada. I was the national consultant that was supporting the IFF pilot project in Namibia. 
So I'll take you through the Namibian process, and even though some of the things are not on the slide, I'll just speak um, onto them if they link to what the slide will be showing. So the Namibian process started by ne the next slide. We, we first of all had the IFF risk assessment and mapping of the institutions that would form the technical working group. We then had training on the six methodologies to measure IFFs. Then we had what we call the national inception workshop to kickstart the DA project. That followed with the review of data availability that informed the choice of methodology that we then applied to measure IFFs in Namibia. We then did country specific training on the chosen methods. Uh, we chose two methods. We'll have, a, we'll have a look at that later on. And after that, we then embarked on data collection, data analysis, stakeholder money engagement, and then the production of a draft report. We then attended the closing workshop of the DA project in Ethiopia, where we gave our estimates and after that, we did a presentation to the heads of the technical working group to validate the draft report. So what was supposed to happen after that was that we are supposed to be tabling this to the cabinet, but because we are not fully done with the stakeholder engagement just to verify some facts on the data that is still delayed. Like I alluded earlier on, we are trying to have a meeting this coming Friday so that we map on the way forward regarding this project that we started last year. So who forms the technical working group? The Bank of Namibia is the lead agency, and this made our work very easy. So we sat down with the Bank of Namibia. We looked at what is the big issue. Then we looked at who can we rope in to assist us in this work. We then brought in the Namibia Statistics Agency as the custodian of data. We brought the Financial Intelligence, the Namibia Revenue Agency, the National Planning Commission because of the development partners who are involved, the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resources. If you are aware, Namibia has got one of the biggest cases that are still pending within courts, which is called dubbed the fish rot, the Ministry of Mines and Energy, Namibia Financial Institutions Provisory Authority, the Anti-Corruption Commission, the Namibian Police, the United Nations Office that was coordinated through the Resident Coordinator's Office, and the National Consultant. So when we did the project and we got the draft report, we've now also decided that we will add a few other groups that includes, for example, the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of the Prosecutor General, because these are also the custodians of the law. So yes, and we are also thinking of how do we bring in the audit firms because of some of the things that we came across as we were busy with data collection and stakeholder engagement. So the two methods that we looked at was the partner country method and the price filter method. The estimate data that came from these two methods from the period of 2018 to 2020, that was the only period where we could find a full data set for statistical purposes. So we got that for the period of 2018 to 2020, IFF is around 12% of the Namibian GDP of only that period. A very worrying figure, but like we're saying, we shouldn't be worried about the figure. If we can measure it, we'll be able to stop it. So we are lucky that we've been able to test it and it's working. That's the good part. So what were the challenges? One, there was no enough time to be trained on all six methodologies. The time frame was short. Therefore, we picked on what we thought could work for us. Lack of complete data sets from the data sources. Even in Comtrade, we found some missing data or we found some discrepancies that could not be explained. Delays in meeting with stakeholders to validate the data. When people start hearing that we are measuring IFFs, we are producing out some figures. So when we want to talk to them, they really dilly dally because they are not sure why do they want to talk to us? What is it that they're looking for? So it wasn't done perfectly, but at least we did some and we will continue validating the information we already have at the same time measuring as we go ahead. 
in some instances, and I know Bojan is very well aware of this, that there was lack of market data on some products that made it difficult to use the market prices method, but this method was effective in producing some estimates of some of the products. Um, those are not the only challenges. There were so many other challenges, but we picked what was key challenges that we faced while we were having this process going on. So what did we learn? Whatever we learned are the benefits of this whole idea. The application of the price partner country method and price filter methods to produce IFF estimates. We've also now learned about the weaknesses in terms of data quality. We've also now learned that there is under declaration, there is under or over invoicing practices by the companies. Then there's also the weaknesses in the customs to detect the misclassification of products. What then are the next steps? Namibia has thought of having an IFF secretariat, and I'm happy to inform you that this is an ongoing process. I think any time now we will have the pronouncement that some people have now been put in the office who will be solely responsible for data collection as we go ahead. We, we're also thinking of getting trained on the other four methodologies because when we got these estimates, we also saw things like profit shifting through transfer pricing that we are now also thinking, oh, if we could apply maybe another one or two methods, we could open up or we could go to a larger scope. And that speaks to the next step that expanding the scope of IFF. We're trying to include more sectors. We would want to include more countries and then we have a broader look that could help us going forward. But the biggest, biggest next step is the collaboration with the UN system to continue working on the IFF project. In simple terms, what we are saying here is true. What has been said from the methodologies, what has been said from what are the actual impacts of IFFs, we've seen it in Namibia and we are not hiding it. What we are now saying here is we are not worried about the 12 percent but we are very concerned that can we now get the knowledge out there that at least we now have the expertise. We're still getting more expertise. We will be able to stop this, maybe not immediately, but could be in the short term and in the long run. I thank you. Thank you so much, Lamik. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I recognize that um, uh, already, there is a demand for using the statistical estimate for coming up with robust policies to address the problem. I also take a note of your um, sharing of the points that you already invested some for IFF Secretariat and we you also recognize continued efforts in expanding the methodologies for not only testing other methodologies, but most probably covering other sectors. And um, I took note that the collaboration was felt as critical uh, in your country aspect. So um, this, I think, all um, uh, expected in the way that we are getting uh, experiences from other pilot countries. So thank you so much and congratulations for pioneering the um, pilot testing. So may I invite Joseph now to please share um, Zambia experience with us. Joseph, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um... Thank you. Yeah. Um, the experience for Zambia is not very different from Namibia. I think we were all trained by the same persons, so we, we basically have more or less the same skills. The only difference is the dynamics in our economies. So I think that depends now on the methods we, we each chose. So um, for Zambia, I think uh, in earnest, you can you can move on. I, I'll be a bit quick because uh, my colleague has already mentioned. In earnest, in Zambia, we, we effectively started the, the work in January 2022 by way of uh, forming a, a technical working group, which was uh, um, appointed actually at, by the secretary to the treasury at the highest government level. That's the level of commitment which uh, the government of Zambia attaches to this important uh, task. And uh, like Namibia, we went through all the stages of, 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 of all the processes as guided in the manual 
provided by the UNCTAD. So we did the assessments all the way up to the, the compilation process. But for Zambia, you will notice that uh, um, though we came in a bit late, but we managed to, to produce something in a space of uh, uh, three months uh, uh, as uh, the, the, the data sits on the infographics and, and UNCTAD uh, can attest to. Um, in terms of uh, collaboration, I think the technical working group uh, basically consists of those institutions listed there. We are about 12 uh, member institutions, and the, the Zambia Statistic Agency was actually uh, elected as the lead institution to lead this process. So that's how we have been collaborating uh, in this in this uh, in this journey. We can move on. Next slide, please. So. While we're undertaking all the necessary processes, I think Zambia came and settled on two methods. I think this was based on the assessment of what's available in Zambia. So for method one, which is partner country method, uh, the agency, Zambia Statistics Agency, was the lead in this one because we house the customs data in conjunction with the ZRA, so Zambia Revenue Authority. So we, 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 we we were found to, to be suitable to take a lead on that one. And uh, the method three was uh, led by the Zambia Revenue Authority. So I can just uh, hasten to mention here that uh, the, this work is uh, also work in progress because there were some of those teething problems we discovered along the way in the, in the process. So we wanted to do a good job. So this is work in progress. And in this, uh, um, uh, in this presentation, you'll find that uh, I'll restrict myself mostly to, to, to partner country uh, approach. Let me just pause a bit. I, I, I silenced my phone. Sorry about that. Yeah, basically that's uh, what we, 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 we did. So what were some of the preliminary outputs or estimates? Uh, so we can find out that uh, the report contains some interesting uh, uh, findings, but like Lamek said, these are just uh, signals. We shouldn't uh, be worrying so much because now we know where the problem is and uh, we can now uh, try to, to, to measure competently and see what uh, methods we can use to mitigate. So you find that in our case, what the figure which came out, the preliminary figure shows that almost twice of that value is what is uh, Zambia's GDP. And it mainly arose from uh, uh, trade misinvoicing. And we looked at a, a span of uh, 2012 to 2020, okay? Uh, on method three, as I mentioned, the, 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 the work in progress, I think we, we moved on, we can move on. We, we, we started from somewhere. Um, uh, the ZRA, I think they, 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 they did some scoping of databases, both in, internal and external, and they came up with a, a list of a database of MNEs operating in Zambia for the period 2019 to 2020. And of course, from the International Taxation Unit, all that was was was, uh, was uh, mined. And uh, as at current, uh, we can safely say that uh, as a team in Zambia, we have classified the MNEs based on the number of employees, total value of sales, profits, before tax and operating profits, and after tax, taxes paid all the way up to the assets that uh, are, are, are accruing to these MNEs. And uh, I can mention here that uh, it's at this stage that our colleagues actually in the in the revenue authority uh, are still you know, grappling with this because uh, you might uh, be well aware that this is uh, something which has been a new phenomenon in most African countries, specifically to Zambia. So we are... Um, we are trying to, to find a way of finding some dedicated staff to, 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 to do this. So this is something which is coming on the table 
for the for the next meeting of the next second working group we shall have it's one of the agenda items so that we guide ourselves on how best we shall we, we, we shall tackle this i think when we come to some of the challenges you already find that uh, the time aspect to allocate to doing this work is, is something which is constrained on our side we move on please so of course we learned a few things there were some challenges and there were some benefits so as i said this being a new thing at the start it was not factored into our institutional work plans as it were it just came in the middle so we we, we grappled a bit with how to handle it but i can assure you that moving forward i think we ZAMSAS has actually factored it in in our current work plan for 2023. So we'll try to see how we can leverage on, on, on a few resources in country and also reaching out to, to, to our sponsors who sponsored us in the initial leg to see how we can, we can be assisted so that aspect. To, 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 to endanger other stakeholders in the technical group so that we see how best we can find a way of allocating time to this uh, important activity because you know if you can't measure it you can't manage it so it's good that we have attempted to measure and have preliminary outputs okay and then issues of data also we are a bit of a problem here and there, especially when you find that there are some data discrepancies when you look at your domestic uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's me or are you breaking, Joseph? Am I breaking, please? Can you? A little bit, yes. Yeah, a little, oh, uh, yeah you are breaking a little bit. So. Is, is this okay now? Maybe I move closer to my... Uh, yeah, no, it might no, be I the think internet it, connection mostly. It might be the connection. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, we need to wrap up as well a bit. Yeah, so basically those were some of the challenges. But uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this information is also sitting on, uh, on our preliminary report, which was submitted to UNCTAD. Right and detail on this one. What we benefited from the exercise, please. Next slide. Next slide. Um, Joseph, so, yes. sorry, we, we, can, we cannot hear you anymore. I think there is a real internet connection problem. Maybe you can try switching off the camera to increase the bandwidth. Yeah. I know this is the last slide, so maybe switch off your okay. camera. That uh, way you I'll can, yeah, you can explain. Are you able to get me now? Yes, we can hear you. Are you able to get me? Okay, so basically we had challenges and we had the benefits also accrued to us in the process. So we basically had uh, 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 a A lot of knowledge which was we gathered from the, the, the interaction with the, the experts from UNCTAD and their partners, they really capacitated us. We can comfortably say we are able now to measure uh, the partner country method confidently. Uh, I think uh, that one is a, is, a, is a big plus to us and thanks to, to UNCTAD and partners for that. And also one of the, the issues I can mention is we have strong support from, uh, from government at a high level so this is work which is actually being uh, encouraged and the, uh, the, the authorities that be are, are waiting for a lot more outputs from the other methods which uh, I think we will also reach out to be trained on, especially method three which relates to taxes. I think that's critical for us. And I can also mention that from the policy implementation, policy implica implication side, of the IFFs. I think it's uh, it's not a, a secret that uh, uh, IFFs 
usually have a very negative bearing on the general economic growth of several countries around the world. So it's basically imperative that uh, we measure them prudently so that we are able to, 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 to mitigate at the right time, at the right point, so that we save the little resources that, that are there. Also, these have another effect on the national budgeting because you see, you need resources to, to, to channel to several, several developmental issues. And if you find that you have a deficit in terms of resources arising from IFFs, then it becomes a challenge. But we shall not cry so much because I think, uh, like many countries, I think uh, there is a legal framework which uh, helps us to, to navigate the issue of uh, such elements like IFFs. In Zambia, there is a legal framework which uh, I think uh, anchors this, and uh, I think it sits in the Financial Intelligence Center space. It's the Antibane Laundering and Financing of Terrorism Act. So this is what I think is used moving forward and think the results can further enhance its implementation. I think for Zambia, we shall pause here, save for the Thank you. intermittent internet connectivity, but I think I'll engage more when it comes to the plenary. I submit, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Joseph, uh, thank you, Chingiz and Lamek as well for these great presentations. Um, we wanted to have an open Q&A now, but we think it's better to do it at the end of the entire event to kind of save time as well and to be able to, uh, based on these presentations, to discuss links between statistical measurement and policy actions. Um, and that is the next session that we'll be having a discussion between UNCTAD, EC, and ESCAP, and, um, and trying to open up then to everyone uh, and answering the questions that we already have in the chat. So without any delay, I'll give the floor back to Boyan, who's going to be chairing next session. Thank you. Thank you, Amadine, and thank you uh, to... to to Chingis, Lamek and Joseph for, for nice presentations and indicating essentially how the, the process on the measurement side worked. And of course, what I think is important is in, in the words that Joseph used, if you can't measure it, you cannot manage it. And this is where we, we turn in this part of the, the event to see how we can connect the IFF measurement to the policy side. So of course, we see how much of an appetite or the demand there is for the IFF measurements in terms of the estimates. We have learned so far that illicit financial flows are a global phenomenon. So they are not only a problem or an issue or a challenge in Africa or in some other countries. Essentially, they cross country borders, which means they are present everywhere in the world. So stemming from our work, from the work of UNCTAD and UNODC as custodians on the measurement side, of course, we have to build a bridge onwards to, to, the, to the policy side, to the policy perspective, and to, of course, see how the estimating illicit financial flows will not only provide clarity and on the scope of AIFFs and improve, for example, key macroeconomic statistics, such as the gross domestic product, but it will also provide robust and independent, which means trustworthy, foundation for the policy formulation. Um, measuring illicit financial flows is a first step in identifying what we can call as threats or risks from illicit financial flows, and of course can then further on lead to the policy formulation. For example, in, in UNCTAD, in, in, in one of the divisions um, back in 2020 in, in the um, economic uh, development report for Africa, um, it was found out that African countries that have higher illicit financial flows are deemed to spend on average a quarter less on health and even up to 58% less on education than the countries with lower levels of illicit financial flows. So, of course, there is a demand for it and we are here to essentially address it, but also to see how the policy and measurement 
how do they work together? Do they speak the same language? If not, how do we do that to bring it together? So how do we adapt the policies? How do we adapt the measurement side? And how to essentially create a loop of constant improvement and enhancement of each other? So the questions that I think we will have today for our distinguished colleagues from ECA and ESCAP is where do we stand in, in, in this particular element so on, on the policy side? So what are the main obstacles to move ahead and which elements are needed from the measurement side and when do we need it? Obviously, we know the response is yesterday, but also to understand what the policy demands are. Only if we collaborate, only if we communicate both ways, can we essentially provide a comprehensive measurement and policy response to the illicit financial flows. So with this, um, I would like to invite, I believe, Farzana from ECA to provide us some of uh, uh, the information on their work on, on the policy side and to see how we can address those issues. Farzana, please. Thanks so much, Mboyan. Thank you so much. You said it all, actually. I don't know where to stand, where to start. So um, I think the most important thing that we all recognize is that the synergy, the uh, mutually beneficial impact of having robust statistics for coming up with informed policy decision to address, it is recognized by the pilot countries. It is recognized by the historical research um, and legacy of the high-level panel on illicit financial flows in Africa. Um, uh, my colleague Douglas has shared this um, in details. I will not repeat it, but I just wanted to share that philosophy. When the high-level panel on illicit financial flows, or popularly known as MBKI panel, uh, started the journey, the main idea was to have these robust statistics, which will inform effective tools to stop the leakage. So these are all very much linked. And um, as you rightly say, Boyan, even in our pilot countries, we have seen that the project was really about statistical estimation of IFFs, the DA level project. But when the pilots started, uh, you know, constructing this technical working group, doing the data mapping, selecting the methodology, it came over and over again that uh, the linkages among the various uh, agencies, that coordination, that partnership, informing the ultimate issues on who are the actors of illicit financial flows, who are what are the channels, who are the perpetrators, what could be the potential areas that needs further investigation. So it's not really about only statistical estimation. Even from the pilot testing phase, we could see the synergy and uh, linkages of the uh, policy measures. Lamek has shared it, even Joseph has shared it um, quite significantly about that linkages. And um, I think this cannot be taken as silos. The ultimate goal of producing indicator 16.4.1 is that this high quality regular official statistics will be used by the policymakers and they will inform the relevant tools to stop the leakage. So these are not silos. This is for one thing. In terms of where we stand, of course, we could see a huge demand from the countries, even the pilot countries, from the inception phase to the whole implementation stage. They did emphasized on this very factor that we are interested to use these statistics. We are not really interested to just report this many billions of dollars leaving the country, but we want to use it. So we could see, and it's a very welcome uh, uh, news for all of us, that we could see the demand. We could see the huge potential for user uh, producer engagement here. Already the demand is here. We have many challenges, definitely. Uh, the presenters have repeatedly said the data quality issues, the data accessibility issues. I think these direct um, technical issues, which is related to the statistical part, these are also indirectly related to the policy parts, like what are the institutions in place to stop this leakage? How are the coordination? How are the data access and um, collaboration among the various actors of illicit financial flows? So um, the 
what are the elements of measurement that is needed? And as you rightly said from yesterday, I think the critical um, go ahead now will be to regularly produce and report these statistics so that the countries already know um, not only the dollar value, the statistical estimate. They also know the whole information throughout the process of estimation and come up with, first of all, to develop relevant strategies to address the illicit financial flows, to uh, invest in capacity building, not only like the statistical estimation part, but also investing in the uh, personnel, in the institutions that will help stop this leakage and link it together. Um, and um, we witness the request from the from the countries. I'll be talking more about it in the following session. I don't want to repeat it now. We have a follow up um, uh, uh, development account project. But um, right now, I think the most important part is to have a coordinated, collaborated approach among all of us. Um, as you rightly mentioned, Boyan, it's a global phenomenon. It's not only African problem, it's not only Asian problem. So we have to continue the solid partnership that we have. And we have to create this, um, you know, uh, demand for using statistics for quality policy making. Thank you. Over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So absolutely. So we are discussing synergies. We are talking about coordination, communication, and essentially linking of various aspects. So not only at the technical level of statistics, but as you mentioned, rightly so, uh, linking to, to the policy side. Um, thank you for Zana. This was very insightful. Um, maybe a, a word now or, or a question now to, to our SCAP uh, colleagues on, on the policy side. So essentially, is there anything you, you could share with us on, on that element? Um, Alec, how, how do you see, how do you perceive the linkages from the measurement to the policy and what are the, the policy status of working in, in your region? Thank you. Okay, um, maybe before I go to that, Boyan, I'll ask Anastasia briefly and then I can come in. Uh, thank you, Alec. My name is Anastasia Maga and uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, we can. Um, I'm uh, the regional consultant for IFF uh, in Naskal for Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, the two countries where we pilot tested. And I'm going to uh, speak about the implications for financing for development uh, and policy implications for, of the IFF measurement. Uh, actually, most of the things that are relevant to that matter have been already mentioned by Boyan and Farzana. I'm just going to show a few examples how these implications work for our country too. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, we can. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, uh, regarding the implications for policy and financing for development, just the, the topic today, uh, we believe there are two kinds of implications. Uh, direct ones that everyone can observe, and these observe implications, they actually are quite directly measurable. Uh, first of all, the, the reduced tax revenue, the IFF result in this reduced tax revenue for government, which makes it difficult to finance uh, development projects, especially those uh, concerning the provision of public goods and uh, services. Uh, secondly, of course, that would result in undermined or hindered economic growth. And uh, in the countries, as already was mentioned today, I believe in some examples from Africa, in the countries with higher IFFs, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the level of economic growth and the level of financing of development projects is lower, which ultimately will result in increased poverty in those countries because IFFs, they uh, exacerbate poverty by diverting resources from development projects and uh, thus leaving some people behind. However, there are also indirect, uh, not necessarily directly measurable implications of IFFs on financing for development, which is the reduced levels of foreign investment, which are affect many countries, especially those involved in international trade and those countries that lack, lack internal resources. Uh, those countries have reduced access to capital inflows. Uh, 
a reduced confidence and distrust in the local financial system and increased corruption in, in such countries also. And of course, increased inequality because also IFFs are highlight the inequality and uh, income inequality in affected countries. So these implications are quite important to take into account. However, those are observed and measurable, directly measurable, are those that we mentioned also today as the shortfalls to public finance. I'm going to uh, demonstrate in only one flow that we have observed in, in the country where we pilot this in the IFFs, uh, which is curious then. And um, uh, for one of our pilot countries for Kyrgyzstan, what we have discovered is that the main source of IFF was uh, trade. And not just all trade, but import trade and especially under invoiced import. Uh, as long as in the public finance of, uh, of the country of, of Kyrgyzstan, uh, uh, tax revenues and especially those tax revenues that relate to e import trade, they, have, they occupy about more than 40% of all tax revenues to the government budget, to the national budget of Kyrgyzstan. These are quite important implications that affect directly the acquisition of resources, capital resources by the national budget of Kyrgyzstan. Here you can see that the uh, main, uh, the main source, uh, uh, the main component of import trade related uh, tax revenues is the value added tax and due to the loss of value added tax and uh, that was caused by the emergence of IFFs caused by under invoiced import, there are tremendous losses to public finance in Kyrgyzstan. According to our very, very rough estimate, these uh, losses, this shortfall in during our uh, estimation, estimation period may have reached about 14 to 20 percent of the budget of the national budget of Kyrgyzstan, which of course this these resources could have been spent on development projects on uh, public goods uh, like healthcare and education and infrastructural development. We also have estimated that possible losses. Uh, may have been equivalent to the range between 200 to 400 million dollars annually. These are only uh, these are the shortfall to the national budget. Thus, uh, we uh, highlight here that measuring IFFs enables us to identify the possible sources. And by having measured IFFs in our pilot countries, we uh, we have identified some sources, but not all of them. Just like the uh, participants from African countries mentioned, we didn't have much time to estimate all efforts from all sources. However, we have uh, we have identified the main ones. Um, I will also provide a link to a paper that working paper that we have published uh, on estimating illicit financial flows from trade in Kyrgyzstan. That is already published on our website where you can read about some of those um, unexpected outcomes of the project that we had and uh, some additional sources of IFF that we have identified in the course of estimation that have direct really did have direct impact on uh, the finance and full development and the po possible future policy action. Thus, in the conclusion of my uh, report of my presentation, I would like to say that measuring IFFs is inherently essential for ensuring that the funds generated from economic activities go to the benefit of society. Measuring IFFs is essential for financing for development and it helps policymakers. Uh, especially policymakers, to understand the extent of the problem, uh, the awareness that is raised as a result of our projects in, the, in Central Asia was uh, quite high, and that's quite a, a large level of interest was peaked. Uh, it helps identify the sources and take steps to prevent it. Thus, by reducing IFFs, eventually governments can increase the resources that may be available for development and financing public goods. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anastasia, uh, for giving that uh, critical uh, piece of uh, evidence based on uh, our work in uh, Kyrgyzstan. Um, but I just want to add uh, a few other things. Um, for those that joined us late, my name is uh, Alec Nyasulu. I'm a statistician in SCAP Statistics Division and has been actively involved uh, in this work um, uh, in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. Um, so I think one thing that uh, we in SCAP observed was the disconnect between um, data production and data users. And uh, we've been uh, running an, a project called um, Every Policy Counts, EPIC. And uh, in this project, we've been working around with a select number of countries where we brought a lot of uh, data users and uh, picking up very specific policies across different sectors of uh, the economy and to see where there actually are data gaps or whether the policies that have been in place actually uh, do have the adequate information uh, that they need uh, for monitoring uh, those uh, um, policies. And uh, this project actually came at the right time because um, the work that we've done on the SDG progress reporting does show um, a lot of data gaps uh, that appear uh, with um, with respect to um, 16.4. But then uh, looking at data users, probably within SCAP internally, we have uh, two other technical divisions. Uh, we have our colleagues in trade and investment uh, division who work closely a lot with countries on matters of trade policy. And uh, we have um, our, another division, I think uh, the equivalent of Waya Fazana and Douglas are working on the policy and the financing division. Uh, these folks also works, work a lot on um, tax policies and they advise countries on different works. And we thought, well, maybe this is the time that maybe internally we could also be having a conversation on how we can share data uh, to see how best they can address uh, uh, those uh, uh, data gaps that actually affect how they advise those countries, for example, on trade policy, trade negotiation. And I think one critical area that uh, we've seen is that um, in situations where you have a customs union, um, there's a big motivation to have um, some kind of trade deflection where non partner members actually would like to take advantage of those preferential uh, uh, trade access. And uh, that's where there's always a big surge in sort of uh, illicit financial flows that emanate from trade. And uh, that really allows uh, maybe policymakers to put um, the right policy safeguards uh, in terms of how they can actually fully benefit from a maybe a customs union or a preferential trade uh, uh, initiative. And I think our colleagues in Africa will pretty know where about the African free trade area or the commercial free trade area. I mean, those are some of the potential areas that uh, we think somebody always has to pay attention to data. And uh, I think it's quite interesting that um, I think as we get to publish a lot of this data, um, um, tax policymakers might actually really explore the different policy tools that they can actually uh, put in place um, to you know increase the resource envelope uh, and address some of uh, the critical uh, gaps or losses in uh, uh, finances so beyond encouraging countries but we are also really trying to promote this uh, within ourselves internally across our divisions that are thematic in area, but we say, well, let us understand data together so that uh, countries can actually be advised. Uh, um, but of course, it's a very tricky subject because as our country counterparts from Kyrgyzstan, Zambia, and Namibia have indicated, there are a lot of players in this game. So um, you need to bring everybody on board, but they should always understand and trust the data. Yeah, so sometimes you tell things that uh, are not very friendly, but um, that's how it works, yeah. So um, this is how we actually trying to approach this by engaging countries to crack on each and every policy, see the data gaps beyond statistic statisticians, as well as um, you know work with uh, our 
experts in different thematic areas. So this is the kind of approach we are actually pursuing in SKP. So thank you so much and uh, over to you, Bojan. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, Alik, for this. This was very uh, informative and I think it, of course, spurs tons of questions and ideas how to move ahead and what are the, the, the next steps. I know we could all discuss this for the next two days without stop. However, we are limited, seriously limited. We only have five more minutes left, uh, which means I regrettably believe we won't be able to take on board um, any questions, uh, but I believe Farzana still wants to share uh, something with us. So let me first give a, a word to Farzana and then we will slowly wrap up very briefly. Farzana, please. Thank you so much, Brian. I will try to be very, very um, brief, but it's my area of enthusiasm. So I took so much note and I wanted to say everything, but I I, I respect the time. So I will be very brief. Uh, so in this session, um, in the next couple of minutes, I will be sharing some of the research experience from ECA and how it links with this statistical estimation, how the two speaks to each other, policy and, and, and uh, statistical measurement of IFFs. So as um, we all um, recognize that illicit financial flows is one of the key developmental uh, challenges because it is diverting the key resources from productive economic activities. And it is even more serious in resource constraint Africa. So the problem was widely recognized um, and in line with the recommendation of the MBK panel, ECA um, did a research on uh, necessarily uh, looking at the institutional arrangements and legal frameworks that could help a country to address the problem and then did a stock taking exercise to see how the countries uh, fare in terms of um, those recommended institutional arrangement and frameworks. So the premier economic governance report of ECA uh, found, uh, recommended that five institutional arrangements and nine legal frameworks really help address aggressive tax avoidance and tax evasion problems in Africa. So those five institutional um, arrangements are policy organ, tax administration, large taxpayer uni, transfer pricing unit, and a supreme audit constitu uh, uh, unit. And if we look at the legal part, there are nine uh, legal frameworks that are essential. I will not read out all. We shared the link of those um, publications in the chat. Please, um, I warmly welcome you to have a look at it. Um, so with these recommended institutional arrangements and legal frameworks, what are we faring at Africa? So the gap, the institutional um, architectural gap, is substantial. For instance, only 22 countries have all five institutional framework in place. And when we look at the nine recommended legal frameworks, it's even bigger gap. Only one country has all nine recommended uh, uh, legal frameworks. So it is obvious that um, even though the publication is um, um, two years back, but within these two years, uh, it's um, expected that nothing drastically changed. So there is this huge institutional gap. But with that institutional gap, we also realized from our experience from this research and from these pilot countries that IFF problems are very complex and is interrelated and it involves actors from different sectors, even within public um, entities. Um, Lamek and Joseph has shared the composition of the technical working group. It, it is involving uh, central bank, um, revenue authorities, customs authorities, police, uh, uh, auditor general's office, everything. So this is a complex landscape. And we found out that a whole of system approach will be critical for addressing these issues holistically. A whole of system approach to know what is the magnitude of IFFs, what are the sources, what are the actors, who are the perpetrators, and you know who are the key people who will help to address this leakage. You then come up with uh, dedicated, um, coordinated approach to avoid duplication of efforts and duplication or competing mandates. And holistically, these issues have to be uh, dealt with. So five strategies could be relevant to have uh, national strategies if we do not have political buy-ins, if we do not have national strategies to really take it seriously, the statistical estimation will just sit alone with the numbers. It will not really inform the policy measures to then stop the leakage and recover the um, 
uh, lost assets. We have to have legal frameworks. We have seen that in many cases, countries do have the legal frameworks in place, but it's not that effective. So we have to bridge that gap. Either we have to enact laws and where we do not have any um, such, um, uh, you know, effective laws, we have to improve the legislative framework so that the IFF combating agencies, first of all, they have the mandates and they have the power to imp 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 implement those um, mandates. They can detect and punish the perpetrators who are uh, 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 chiffoning that um, uh, illicit financial flows out of the country. We have to have an operational framework, and I think it also came even from Asian countries, even from the African pilots that, you know, the coordination among the uh, involved agencies is critical. So the countries need to really look into that. Um, capacity building is a must. IFF is a very complex issue and then is very technical also. So countries need to really invest in data infrastructure, data management system for the statistical part, but also for the institutional part to have the relevant institutions and the legal frameworks in place to train the personnel so that they are up to date with the required skills and the tools. And Boyan, you have mentioned this, like, you know, it's a global phenomenon. So for IFF, it is critical that the countries really ensure the relevant regional and international cooperation. In Africa, there are some uh, regional initiatives like at this tax um, initiative, uh, the inclusive framework on base erosion and profit shifting, the global forum on transparency and the exchange of information and you uncock an AU convention. But I'm sure the other regions also have this kind of um, regional treaties that will empower the countries to partner with other countries to partner with development um, other development partners last but not least i really wanted to focus and highlight this um, important issue of collaboration and coordination among all of us to have a concerted approach i wanted to share very briefly that in response to countries um, request for continuation of our work in deepening statistical measurement and linking policy measures we are implementing a follow-up development account project, um, which will be deepening our statistical measurement work and link it more effectively um, uh, with the policy issues. Um, in that um, development account project, I'm very happy to share with you that we will be developing the training materials. So first of all, the participating countries can hone their statistical estimation work and link it with the policy measures. But the aspiring countries, you are most welcome to explore those materials. You can already start the methodologies and you can even learn from other peers to come up with um, concerted uh, policy measures uh, to address this problem. Um, last, uh, finally, um, coordination, coordination and coordination. So we have to continue and deepen our coordination, linking all stakeholders involved. Thank, Thank you, you so Susanna. much. This is uh, very true. And I think there's a bunch of us who are very excited about the current work and also the future plans. So we are very um, eager to, to see how this work uh, turns on. So um, let me now just maybe ask um, very briefly. Um, I I know we are already uh, past the time. So there was a link uh, pasted in the chat. Dear participants, please accept our apologies for running somewhat late. But if there are any burning questions, please, please feel free uh, to reach out to us. There is a contact over there or in the chat here, we, we will try and address it as much as possible. But for now, um, Alik, um, maybe you have a final word and then we ask Douglas and then um, uh, we will close. Please, Alik, the floor is yours. OK, thanks, uh, uh, Bojan and colleagues. And uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon or this evening, this morning. Um, and uh, I know we had a couple of questions. Zambia, they already tell us they're publishing their data. So great news. And then there was something to do with uh, what is the risk of retaliation for doing this work? Well, that was a very good question. But, you know, this work is really collaborative in nature. So we work with um, a lot of agencies and uh, the key statistical principles actually apply that this is purely for statistical purposes, not for, you know, judicial needs and all those things. So those are some of the separates, mm -hmm. of course, notwithstanding any other potential risk that happened. But um, this is how we approach this. And I think uh, for this way to be successful, you didn't need to be talking to everybody because uh, these um, IFFs cut across different institutions. 
and a lot of uh, regulatory uh, frameworks that exist across different agencies. You cannot address it by law. You need to get people to talk to each other and understand why this is important for the country. I think this was a key message and the key lesson we learned. So thanks so much. And um, please take time to go through the conceptual frameworks and find out what is based and what can work for your respective countries. But uh, you know what? This is very important work, particularly in terms of financing uh, sustainable development and trying to address uh, the different gaps uh, in terms of the national um, the, uh, revenue framework. Yeah. So we're excited to go into next phase and uh, we look forward to work with you all and uh, we hope each one of you will be an advocate and ambassador of this work. Thanks so much. Thank you, Alec. Very well said. Um, let's see, Douglas, if you can actually add anything to this. Thank you. Well, that's a very good uh, good question. Whether I have anything to add on what has already said, but I just want to emphasize that. Uh, <clears throat> um, thank, uh, first of all, thanking everyone for their participation. Um, second, to reiterate that the ECA uh, bidding on the ev evidence and even the productive discussion we've had already, but most importantly, uh, bidding on the mandate of Minister of Finance. Um, recommending ECA to deepen our work in building capacity of member states in um, <clears throat> tax related matters, including IFFs, but also try to build capacity in terms of to bridge the institutional gaps to, to move towards effective tackling of IFF remains ECA's priority. Second, we know that um, given the scope and the, the nature of the issue we are talking about, um, no one can do it alone. So that's why the ECA is really, really committed to work hard towards strengthening our partnership with um, institution partners uh, to join the hand towards actually addressing this very, very important global and development matter. I thank you all. Thank you very much, Douglas. And I think there was a, as an African proverb, at least that's how I understood it. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And this, I believe, is essentially the model of all of us here. Let's do it together. It has been said many times, collaboration, 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 communication, communication, communication at all stages, at all levels. Not so within ourselves, within international organizations, within within the countries themselves, um, but also, of course, within a specific office. So I think those are important elements. And I think trying to address one of the very um, specific questions that was in the chat is, if we approach sensitive um, areas such as illicit financial flows from a technical perspective, we um, essentially um, provide the needed robustness and impartiality and objectivity to the approach, which means this is then a proper policy um, foundation on which essentially uh, policies to curb illicit financial flows can be made. So I think it is important to have impartial um, approach, technical approach, and then link it to the policy side. So this is what um, the upcoming global project is going to address, and, and hopefully we will be able to address it all together and to move ahead. So on, on this note, I would like to thank each and every one of you uh, for participating, for joining, for sharing, and also for your patience with uh, with our timing and also with the questions. Uh, since this is a, an online event, we are not able to see each other in person, but we have done it previously. And if you are in a position, we'll be very happy to see your faces. Please turn on your camera so then we see we have a lot of people in here um, and we just want to thank you all. Uh, for joining in and wish you all the best uh, for our future work and we do hope to 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 stick around uh, all together thank you thank you wow so many cameras wonderful yes maybe you can take a photo <laughs> thank you everybody Maybe we should take a photo. Yeah, that's Let's... nice. Yeah, it yeah, is. Everybody, maybe switch on your camera so we just have uh, <laughs> <Not much. laughs> an official photo. A couple of footprint free. And, and don't, for, don't forget to smile while we're taking photos. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's an illicit event.
Yeah. Edit for me, please. We need to talk, Eric. You're calling it illicit event. Yeah, exactly. Kind About of. illicit. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. I wish you a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, and good night. And um, uh, we look Thank forward to our next steps together. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Goodbye.